So welcome everybody. My name is Ellen Brilliant and I am the Executive Director for the American Academy of Pediatrics Colorado Chapter. Um, we are really appreciative of everyone joining us today um, to talk about food security um, and poverty and ways that we can help mitigate um, the challenges faced by uh, the children whom we serve and the families whom we serve. I wanna let everybody know that we are recording this uh, session and do intend to share the recording um, with interested uh, AAP Colorado members and, and others. Um, so uh, just a, a housekeeping note on that front. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists as well as uh, turn it over to them as, as soon as we are done with introductions. Um, but today's session is not only hosted by AAP Colorado, but also hosted by our partners at Family Voices Colorado and the Colorado Center on Law and Policy. And we will put um, <laughs> their links in the box uh, so you guys can get a little bit more information about those organizations. Um, AAP Colorado began partnering more formally um, with these two organizations, um, given our, our sort of different missions, but our common um, mission of uh, supporting children and families in Colorado, we realized by connecting dots, um, leveraging each other's strengths and expertise, um, we could probably do more um, outside of the exam room, in the exam room and outside of the exam room to, to really help address um, child uh, poverty and, and whatnot. So with that, our presenters today um, are gonna be from each of the organizations and um, present uh, sort of the different perspectives, but weave together how um, we can leverage each other's strengths um, to best serve Colorado children and families. Um, so the first person I'm going to introduce is Dr. Sandy Stenmark. Many of you know Sandy um, from her great work as a pediatrician and champion of food security and nutrition and obesity prevention um, from her work over the years. Sandy serves as the AAP Colorado's champion on um, food security. So we are thrilled that Sandy is here and leading the charge um, for this session today. Um, also, uh, one of our presenters is Sarah Lipowitz. Sarah is a staff um, attorney with the Colorado Center on Law and Policy. Um, she serves as their public benefits attorney. Um, and Sarah has lots of experience um, on the legal side of things, working in the area um, of, of SNAP and WIC and, and other benefits, um, advocacy around that. And then finally, um, really important, as we all know, is the connection um, that we have with uh, families and um, parents. And um, there are great family advocate partners in our community. Um, and so we've asked Christy Blakely um, to join us from Family Voices Colorado um, to give sort of an illustration of just how one group um, is, is able to support the work that we do um, as pediatricians and pediatric professionals. So with that, Sandy, Sarah, and Christy, do you have anything you want to add in relation to your, okay. Then with that, I will um, turn it over to you, Sandy. And if you're ready, we can load up the slides and I will add things in the chat box as we go along. Perfect, thank you so much. And um, Sarah, Christy, and I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you about this real critical opportunity we have to improve child health and well being because of the American Rescue Plan. And I'll also touch on the American Infrastructure Plan. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, we wanted to just start um, this talk off by um, asking a question about what are you either doing or do you think are effective practices to reduce poverty and food security in households with children? Um, and Leisha will launch the poll. So it's either screening all families um, for both, giving families resources who screen positive, promoting SNAPWIC and the child tax credit, facilitating enrollment or integrating WIC with healthcare. So if everyone could um, just put in their responses to just get um, an idea of what people are either doing or think are effective practices, um, you can answer it anyway.
All right. So the vast majority are um, the screening for food insecurity and, and, and um, poverty. And um, the lowest percentage is also uh, uh, promoting SNAP, WIC, and the child tax credit. Um, Andrea Netterveld, a uh, physician on, um, in Mesa County, has actually talked about the importance of promoting the programs. And uh, I think that um, we'll talk more about this, that um, when um, people know about the resources, uh, they're more likely to accept the resources. She talks about leading with resources rather than screening um, because of uh, it decreases stigma and shame when you do that. Um, so we'll talk more about that. Um, next slide, or next question is, um, what percent in Colorado of eligible families do you think are enrolled in WIC? So Leisha, if you can just please launch this poll and we'll see what. Okay, do we have? <clears throat> um, it's, it's actually 50%. So there's real opportunity in Colorado when we know that um, I actually, um, and it changes by age, by the age of four, uh, only 7% um, of ch eligible children are enrolled in our state. Um, so next question is the same question about SNAP. So what percent of your of eligible Medicaid members in Colorado are enrolled in um, SNAP? So if you can go ahead and um, enter that. Uh, our um, percentage is uh, really mirrors the national percentage. All right, do we? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it actually is 45%, so it's even lower than 50%. So again, a huge opportunity to, um, when we have food pantry lines that are growing, yet the, we're leaving federal dollars on the um, table, we're not enrolling people in effective programs that we know improve food security. We have a real opportunity to sort of shift how we're thinking about this. And then the last question is, um, what percent of your Medicaid members do you think are eligible for WIC? All right, Leisha. <laughs> I apologize. I think we misloaded that question. We might need people to put their responses in the um, chat box for this one. Oh, it's all right. Sorry. Uh, no worries. It actually is um, all of Medicaid members are eligible for WIC. So again, it changes the opportunity um, to, rather than screen for food insecurity, we need to be promoting WIC and all the health benefits and enrolling people rather than um, having the multiple steps with food insecurity screening. Again, much more strength-based to ask if you're enrolled. All right, um, next slide, please. So a, a, a little background information. Uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, childhood poverty is uh, a huge problem of any de demographic. Um, children in our richest country in the world are the most poor. This is before COVID. And you can see the average uh, child poverty uh, rates are 15%. And um, sadly, you also see the huge disparities, um, obviously policies and investments, uh, the way um, the United States has done that has resulted in these horrible disparities that you see with um, one fourth of uh, black children living in poverty. Um, uh, the, something to note is that um, Obviously, race and ethnicity 
um, impact your poverty levels. But other things, other populations that are more at risk are if um, parents have mental health issues, complex medical issues, or if the children themselves have complex medical issues, they're more likely um, to be in poverty. I, I don't know if any of you went to this, but 10 years ago, Children's Hospital did a grand rounds on reducing uh, poverty. And uh, a British physician talked about how Tony Blair had committed to having poverty in a decade and he was successful. And some of the policies that the American Rescue Plan and American Infrastructure Plan are modeled on those successful policies of decreasing poverty. Um, next slide, please. Um, as you can see on this slide, um, the COVID pandemic markedly increased um, child food insecurity and the disparities. So um, this is pretty startling because most, most of the time what the statistics that are shared are um, uh, how, how households with children are impacted. And you can see that um, third, uh, almost a third of black children are struggling um, to afford food and uh, Hispanic next uh, with white children, the least impacted. Um, next slide. Um, obviously poverty and food insecurity are not good for your health. If you haven't read these two American Academy of Pediatric um, statements, uh, policy statements, they're wonderful on poverty and on promoting food insecurity. They're both connected with poor health outcomes, lower birth weight, actually even um, structural brain um, changes um, lower educational attainment and a greater likelihood of risky behaviors. Um, a real important concept is the earlier in life um, poverty or food insecurity occur and the longer exposure, the greater the risk. Um, so, uh, similar to the uh, another AAP uh, that I should have included was the nutrition in the first 1,000 days, a really key um, time to make sure that children are doing well during that period. Next slide. When, when we think about um, poverty and why poverty is associated with po poor child outcomes, there are two pathways to think about. One is the investment pathway. So can parents afford uh, child care or, or early childhood education. We know in Colorado, there's many um, child care deserts. Uh, so people have uh, very limited um, patchwork arrangements. Um, do they have the money to buy nourishing food? Do they have the money to allow their children to, uh, to participate in after school and summer programs? Um, while I was a pediatrician, I couldn't believe the change in um, sort of what everybody says pay to play. Many um, school, public school <laughs> districts are now charging $100 or more per sport, which uh, prices children out of these opportunities. So definitely not having income. Another thing to think about though is, is the stress pathway so that we know if you live in poverty or struggling to uh, afford to feed your children, um, you, you're incredibly stressed. As we all know, if we can all imagine all of our lives during COVID, the stress of just having to do that one adaption made every task uh, just a little bit more complicated. So when when families are really stressed and trying to make ends meet, they don't have um, the bandwidth to as much bandwidth to meet their child's needs, to parent them, to provide for them. And um, I think that uh, that's another um, pathway to poor child outcomes. Uh, next slide. 
Well, the good news is the American Rescue Plan is really a game changer and an incredible opportunity. Um, it's predicted to decrease child poverty by 40 to 50% with its key programs. But this reduction will only occur if um, all families take advantage of it. And this is where your help um, as uh, um, pediatricians, healthcare systems are, are needed. Um, there, there's two groups. There's the increase and expansion of um, the tax credits and the um, increase in the federal nutrition assistance benefits. The biggest ticket item is the increase in the child tax credit. So previously, the child tax credit only, uh, it did not include a third of the poorest children in our country, predominantly children of color. You had to make a certain amount of income to be eligible for this. So this tax credit, which is a significant amount of money, as, um, especially if you combine it with the earned income tax credit, could really lift families that were never eligible for this benefit out of poverty. So that's probably the one thing Sarah will, uh, Lepowitz will um, discuss, and we have materials um, actually from the Academy of Pediatrics in English and Spanish to um, help you promote this. Um, then there's also been an increase in um, benefits. So the um, SNAP benefit has been increased 15%, um, which has helped a lot of families during the pandemic and um, the fruit and vegetable for the WIC program has also been increased. So really, if we could enroll um, eligible families in these benefits, it would make um, a huge difference in their um, income and uh, food security. Next slide. I have to say that I was embarrassed that I really did not know until a, a few years ago this literature well. And um, I put in three uh, really good um, articles. Um, the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities summer, beautifully summarizes the all the research on WIC and SNAP. And um, in about four pages, um, the uh, other, uh, the roadmap to end pov child poverty or to reduce child poverty is another great document if ever you need any resources. But what I wanted, what these articles all talk about is that all of these programs improve food and economic security. They all decrease low birth weight. Um, they improve par parental mental health and child behavior. Again, pr probably much of that might be through that stress pathway and thereby increasing development and educational outcomes. Um, and an interesting um, article talks about when the SNAP program in the 60s was rolled out. It was rolled out county by county, so they had a natural comparison group. They tracked for 30 years pregnant women and young children who participated in SNAP. And 30 years later, what was their outcome compared to those that did not participate in the neighborhood county, neighboring counties? What they found is that those children had much higher um, high school graduation rates, better economic security, and a really marked decrease in metabolic syndrome. So that, um, and I, I think the, um, one of the messages too is the need to message these programs as health programs. Um, how often have you heard of uh, SNAP as a diabetes prevention? But it, it is, and we, the more we use health language to promote these programs, the more we'll decrease the stigma associated with them. This is one of the, um, uh, what um, Alicia Anderson and I worked on about what, what pediatricians um, can do. And again, I want to talk about the importance of just promoting these programs and um, being able to 
talk about um, the breast free breastfeeding support you get with WIC, um, the, uh, um, the nourishing food you can buy with SNAP, uh, the extra funds you can have to help your family, and to do it in a way that um, all families need support, or so many of my patients have really benefited from these programs in a way that decreases stigma. Um, I think the other um, important thing is um, when you, how, how do you promote the health benefits and make sure that this is part of, by referring all pregnant women uh, that are on Medicaid and all children to WIC, um, you, uh, it can be a positive, it's the health benefit of these programs. This is why I want you to, uh, this is why I'm interested in you um, participating in these programs. So you can ask families rather than, are you struggling to uh, make ends meet or afford food? Ask them if they filed their taxes or um, Sarah will talk about there's, there's a non-filer um, site that has just been um, activated. Um, ask Medicaid members if they're enrolled. It's quite different as a mother. I'd rather be asked, am I enrolled in these programs rather than am I struggling to afford um, to feed my family? Um, one of the things that we found is that literature has shown that some families you know, won't say that they're struggling to afford food. And, um, but are more, but are still willing to take um, this, be enrolled in uh, food assistance. So uh, again, leading with resources. And um, finally, um, we'll give you some resources on how to facilitate enrollment in SNAP and WIC. I think there's many different opportunities. Um, Leisha and I have worked on the Blueprint to End Hunger uh, and, we would love, um, there may be funding available to help do this. Um, we would be happy to help um, your practice, uh, to tailor things for your practice. So um, more to come on that. And we'd love to have more discussion about what help would be most useful. Uh, next slide. Sarah. Do you want to take over from here? Thank you. Sure thing. So this is Sarah Lipowitz from uh, Colorado Center on Law and Policy. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the changes that have just been made to the child tax credit. And starting with a bit of background, you saw slides earlier about the varying percentages of children living in poverty broken out by demographic group in 2019, the overall rate was of poverty for kids under the age of 18 was 14.4%. That, And we don't really have good data in yet from the pandemic year on that, because while there was a spike in unemployment, there were also some more cushioning programs put into place that I think may have addressed uh, the gap there, at least to some extent. So. Of that 14.4%, about 6% were living in deep poverty, which is defined as 50% of the federal poverty level, which in and of itself is just one of the ways that the federal government uh, measures poverty in the United States. There are other ways some folks think, and I'm one of them, that there are better ways that incorporate more up-to-date ideas of uh, what living in poverty actually looks like. But the federal poverty rate is used for these programs that we're about to talk about. So that is the main one that we're gonna talk about today. And what we've seen is that cash transfers are effective in moving children out of poverty. If uh, you ever get a chance to take a look at the report that Dr. Stenmark referenced the roadmap to ending child poverty. I believe there was a link in the materials. It's very lengthy. You don't have to read the whole thing. It's got a good executive summary, but it talks about 
uh, the ways in which these programs can be improved and expanded and how many children would be lifted out of poverty just by doing that. So to get the child tax credit, it says that the credit will now reach the poorest families or more of the poorest families to do to reach those families, the yearly income that you had to make to qualify was lowered to $2,500 a year. And it starts to phase out at household incomes of about 200,000. So a vast range of families are going to qualify. Most families with children are going to qualify. Uh, families that are not accustomed to filing taxes because there is a certain threshold amount below which if you don't make much money, you don't have to file your taxes. There are services that we have referenced here in the materials to help people do file their taxes and to get advice on how to do that. Uh, people who are experiencing poverty don't usually have complicated financial reporting that they have to do. So they're their tax forms are usually pretty simple to handle, and there are resources out there. Um, tax credits are one way of addressing uh, poverty. The problem with them is that they only benefit people with income. There are households that have no income at all, and there are, but I do think that lowering this income amount is going to push it to uh, many, many more families. Also something to talk about on the child tax credit is you don't need a social security number to qualify for it. There is an alternate number that people who don't have a social security number can obtain from the IRS. There's directions on their website on how to do that. You are actually, whether you're documented or not, you are required to file taxes if you're here. So there are quite a number of families who do use an, uh, what they call an ITIN, this alternate number. And so people can obtain one of those and they can get the benefits of the child tax credit. Uh, next slide, please. The earned income tax credit is a similar sort of uh, assistance for people who are uh, working or have at least a small amount of income. And that's been increased, as you see on the slide here, you know, um, from about $500 to about $1,500. That's quite a benefit for many families. The problem with the earned income tax credit is that you do need a social security number to qualify, but they're, so they're not gonna take that, that alternate number, but you can still get the child tax credit, which I think would come out to be quite a considerable amount of money, even without the earned income tax credit layered on top of it. Uh, next slide, please. So just to talk a bit about SNAP, SNAP is the, it stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It is the largest anti-hunger program in the United States and also in Colorado. About 460,000 individuals in Colorado are receiving SNAP. Probably that's gone up a bit during the pandemic. And there's also, uh, as you saw earlier, there are people who are eligible who don't know that they're eligible and that they could be getting the benefits of the program if there was uh, outreach that got to them about the program itself. So as you see here, majority of Medicaid members are eligible. So those folks that you're seeing in your office, they if they are on Medicaid, that should be a good signal to say, you know, this is something else that I really think you ought to look into. I think that those words coming from a doctor actually help decrease the stigma of signing up for programs. And maybe Dr. Stenmark can talk a bit about that, but uh, that person is often a trusted individual, someone who can reach, who can reach clients on a level that, that perhaps, you know, just going into the benefits office with the stigma attached to that maybe is, it's gonna help them overcome that, which is part of the reason we're doing this presentation today, because I think you all out there have a great potential to make a big difference. There are, by virtue of qualifying for SNAP, you also qualify for uh, school meals and pandemic EBT, which is a form of uh, school meals that people are getting electronically 
on their benefits card to make up for the fact that schools were closed. They have been able to receive the cash value of the meals that children would have been receiving if they had been able to be at school in person. EBT stands for Electronic Benefits Transfer Card and it is a card that works like a debit card. SNAP funds go onto that card. Also, some of the other programs that we're not really going to talk about, but which are aimed at families such as temporary assistance uh, to needy um, TANF. What does that stand for? Gosh. I'm blanking right Temporary now. Temporary aid to needy families. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. So many acronyms. So many acronyms. So that is a that is a, a cash program that goes to families and people who get TANF also get SNAP. SNAP is aimed at uh, food purchases only. So on the EBT card, the SNAP money is different from the TANF money. TANF money can be used to buy food, but it's but SNAP money can only be used to buy food and only certain kinds of food. You can't buy prepared meals. You can't buy alcohol. You know, there's, you can't buy diapers, which is a problem for families. And I'm going to talk a bit more about on the next slide. But um, it does provide a, a level of nutrition that people need. People usually run out of uh, SNAP before the end of the month. That's where we often see a disconnect in, you know, what people can afford. So people are often having to having to pay more than the amount of their SNAP benefit just to get some, just to get uh, the nutrition that they need. But it's still better than not being there, and it does free up money in the household budget for other purposes. Oh, and uh, citizenship status is no longer impacted by SNAP participation. So what that means is you, you can't be, you have to be documented to participate in SNAP, but participation in SNAP is not going to count against you for adjusting to a citizen status. There was a very harsh uh, version of the public charge rule during the last administration that re that said if you got any of these public benefits programs, even ones that we didn't used to count before, we would not allow you to adjust status because we think that you can't support yourself. But I think the benefits of making sure that people get adequate nutrition outweigh those, of those effects. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm getting some info in the chat about, yeah. Yeah, see, that's that's another I'm problem. Just adding, Sarah, I'm just adding all the information that that you're talking about. Yeah, that you know, diapers are only provided through Medicaid for children who are over age six, and if they need them because they are disabled, that I mean, I feel like diapers are such a necessity of life. We should just be able to get them to people. We did have legislation that was passed in this last uh, session to uh, meet diaper need in Colorado by appropriating some money from the general fund to purchase diapers and allow them to be distributed through food pantries. And there's a diapers, I love to talk about diapers. Uh, diapers are a uh, work support because very often people can't access childcare if they can't send a supply of diapers with their child. Most child care centers aren't going to want to fuss around with cloth diapers. I, I had twins, so diapers were a big part of my life. Um, so yeah, WIC also doesn't cover diapers, which is a terrible oversight, but WIC does provide a lot of other great benefits. And you can receive SNAP and WIC at the same time. So people sometimes don't know that. WIC covers people who are pregnant, and then the children all the way up to the age of five. As I was talking with someone in the chat earlier, some we often see in Colorado that the program is undersubscribed, only about 50% of people who could be getting it are getting it. And then we see a drop off at the around the age of one. And we're hypothesizing that that may be because a lot of the really good benefits of WIC, such as the breastfeeding support may no longer be needed. Uh, formula is included in the WIC benefit and that may no longer be needed. 
but there still is WIC for kids up to the age of five, and it can be layered on top of SNAP to make sure there's additional there's additional uh, nutrition in the household. WIC is even more restricted than SNAP in what people are allowed to buy. So if you've been at the grocery store and you sometimes see the little tag on the shelf, you might see you know, WIC on there that denotes that it is a WIC eligible item. There's only certain, yeah, <laughs> I see that. I see you, Dr. Mitchell, I see you. Um, yeah, so there's the range of goods that you can get with WIC is smaller than that of SNAP, but it's still uh, very useful. And there's uh, enrollment, as you see here, at WIC offices, sending a WIC online referral. There's various ways of signing up for WIC, and it's a program I'd like to see more people be involved with. Uh, next slide. Okay, I will turn it over to Christy. Unmute myself. Um, so as providers, you all have uh, tools in your tool belt and you're super busy um, and we know that. So um, I'm introducing you to the family driven organizations that work primarily with children with special needs, which is a very small subset of what we're talking about today, but a resource nonetheless, and one that I want you all to be aware of. Well, when, when I'm talking about family-driven organizations, I'm really talking about organizations that are run by parents who also have experienced in their lives children with special health care needs. These are all four organizations, Family Voices, El Grupo Vida, which is Spanish-speaking folks, Parent to Parent of Colorado, and family, the Family to Family Health Information Center that's funded by HRSA, um, all are able and do uh, assist with WIC and SNAP and work with families finding the resources to keep them A, out of poverty, but also to keep those families strong and healthy. Um, we know today's families are more complex than ever before. Um, I spoke to a mom yesterday with a child with special needs and she wanted to be able to be a CNA for her child but, um, but she has a, a felon in her past. And um, so when I say complex, I mean, these organizations are the ones that really work with families that are the most complex because they've got kids with special needs and other things in their lives. We are a resource um, to those families because we also know as providers, these families take more of your time. Um, and so I ask that you refer to these to these family driven organizations. We we talk about Medicaid waivers. So those are children that are on Medicaid, but the income of the family may or may not be Medicaid eligible. But because of the child being at an institutional level of disability, those families, those kiddos are on Medicaid and do qualify for the services we're talking about. Um, we had Sarah from CCLP, the Colorado Center on Law and Policy. Um, they aren't necessarily somebody we refer to, but I couldn't do the work of Family Voices Colorado without uh, CCLP in, as a wingman. They're the ones that are barrier, barrier busting and finding the issues and needs in the state of Colorado, the barriers, the things that aren't working right. And then they take that in a policy way um, and fix it or work to address it. Um, and many of these family driven organizations work very closely with CCLP, which is why they're an expert in this work. Um, we understand these families take more time, but we wanted to give you these resources because we're asking you to also look at all these other families that may have food insecurity, housing insecurity, financial problems, and we want you to be successful at what you're doing. And we appreciate what you're doing because you all are really the cornerstone to many, many families and what they're able to do. Any, anything else that you all want me to add to that? Okay, then we're gonna to go to the next slide. 
Thank you, Christy and Sarah. Um, the other, uh, besides um, learning from you, which we will do after, uh, after this slide, um, the other opportunity I want to talk about is um, how important it would be for you to become an advocate. Um, the child tax credit is only through this year. Um, uh, so it will be important as advocates to make sure there is either a child tax credit or a child allowance um, and to stay involved with that as, and, and through the Academy of Pediatrics um, that can occur. Um, and, and again, as um, Sarah talked about, or the SNAP and WIC benefits really aren't adequate to, for food security. So how do we make sure that we lobby and um, make sure that the benefits um, are adequate? Um, uh, there is um, the Blueprint to End Hunger is working on this. And there's a group that's just coming together if anybody's interested in participating on um, uh, its event. It's a joint effort between the Colorado Medical Society, uh, the Blueprint and Hunger and Nourish on how we can get um, more nutritious food in our state to SNAP recipients. Um, obviously advocating for a living wage so uh, people don't need the benefit programs um, would be is important. Uh, advocating for quality early childhood education for all children. Uh, this is part of the infrastructure bill. And so it's really important to lobby, um, uh, to write your um, Congress people to about this infrastructure, which um, again is so critical and so many other countries, this is a, a given, it's our country that it's, that it's not. And lastly, I know many of your health systems are, um, providing um, long acting reversible contraception to adolescents asking for that and some on the same day uh, basis. And, and we know that this is another huge poverty reduction um, uh, practice that um, many of you, and we need to continue to make sure that people have access to these services. Um, so we, what we'd like to do now is really open it up with um, understand your ideas, what's working well in this area in your practices, where you see opportunities, and you know how, how could we all work together to advance this agenda, knowing that there's others interested, like the Blueprint to End Hunger, the Academy of Pediatrics. So um, I'd just love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Sandy. So I'm going to um, just give a, a little heads up to our presenters that um, we will conclude our session at uh, 115 with maybe a final word from each of you as to what would be the key pearl you would want participants to take away. There's lots of information that we've shared today. As I put in the chat box, we'll, we'll send out the links, we'll send out the PowerPoint, we'll send out the recording. Um, but if there was just one sort of pearl of wisdom um, of all the information that we've shared today. So just a heads up that that's how we'll conclude. And then we'll turn it over to participants. We'd love folks, and um, we recognize it's lunchtime, uh, but if you join any AAP Colorado webinar, we'd love to see people on screen, whether you're eating your lunch, um, taking a walk on the Peloton or whatnot. So if folks can turn on their screen and join us, we would love to see your faces as it makes uh, for a more dynamic discussion. So right off the bat, are there some general questions um, before we go into maybe some um, uh, ideas of, of ways of which we could work together? General questions about SNAP and WIC. What about um, success stories? Are any of you finding in your practices a way that you have overcome a barrier? Um, I'll say, uh, I think I met with you guys uh, a little bit ago, but I, I've been able to start actually signing people up for WIC. Um, and I think one of the more helpful things is actually to um, start promoting them as health um, health programs and, you know, looking at, I can see what their insurance is and I see it's Medicaid and then I can say, hey, um, are you signed up for WIC? Are you signed up for SAP? And if they say no, it's saying, all right, let's do it right here in the office. And I've been able to sign up a few families, which is pretty exciting. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. 
That's great. Thanks, Beth. Carol, do you want to talk about Denver Health? You have a lot going on there. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Stenmark, you're putting me on the spot. Uh, um, I just for a little bit of background, I'm not a primary care pediatrician. Um, I uh, I work in the hospital and I'm an ICU physician, uh, but got interested in programs, um, WIC and SNAP. Um, and so, things that we have at Denver Health is that we have co-location of WIC uh, in our practices, which allows the families to hopefully easily enroll. Um, with the co-location of those offices where primary care is delivered. Um, and then in addition, um, from the inpatient standpoint, one of the things that we've worked on is having WIC available to moms that deliver here at the hospital. And so actually at the time that they deliver, we have a WIC person go upstairs and talk to the moms about the importance of getting enrolled and the benefits for both the mother and the child. Um, and so that's been really great. And then um, Dr. Stenmark, you, uh, or someone mentioned the breastfeeding benefits also of WIC. Uh, they have been very helpful in um, supporting our breastfeeding moms um, in the nursery as well. So I look at all of those as success stories related to WIC. I think that there's a lot of work going on right now. Um, I know at the clinics, of trying to do WIC and SNAP enrollment so that it's uh, all one thing, uh, one-stop shopping for our families. Um, and so I think that we're gradually building that infrastructure. Obviously, um, it can never go fast enough, I feel like, but uh, there is progress being made. Carol, if I can add to that, I, I've been working with Meg Tomko at The Blueprint and um, she's working on, integrating WIC, not just co-locating it, but so at the same appointment, rather than the pediatrician talking about um, uh, nutrition and then the WIC waiting a couple hours and getting your WIC appointment, the WIC person is um, integrated into OB, OB and pediatrics, and they're trying to do that, which I think would is sort of a game changer and improve efficiency and care coordination. And the other interesting thing I think that um, Denver is doing is at the time of enrollment in Medicaid, trying to enroll families in SNAP. So they're working on a um, warm handoff with um, human services, with Denver Human Services. So that would be, and uh, Children's Hospital, again, a large institution that can do things. They have a, um, a Denver Human Service person in their, um, their oh, what do they call it, resource connect area. So this person's um, enrolling in, in benefits and, and answering questions about benefits. Um, so for large institutions, there's different possibilities. And um, what Leisha and I are working on with the blueprint is, is trying to tailor it um, every clinic can do something and trying to help people tailor to what meets your needs. And then um, if interested, uh, Leash is an expert on process improvement, which um, I think is uh, one thing that we did find when we uh, were evaluating Children's Denver Health and Kaiser did food insecurity screening and referral to Hunger Free Colorado about ten, uh, eight years ago. And it would resulted in very low enrollment in SNAP. So this is why we're trying to instead say, can we promote these programs and facilitate an enrollment in a more strength-based approach? So um, others, uh, thoughts about um, either success or what would be needed to help advance this work in your practice? This is um, Bethany at CCLP, and so I'm not a, a provider, but um, I'm really interested in, um, you know, how that why what, the screening is not sufficient, and that needs questions need to be asked differently. You know, promoting it as a as a health um, benefit rather than asking someone if they're food insecure. Um, and you know, there's so much work going on at, at healthcare policy and financing about, um, you know. 
tying screening for social determinants to certain incentives and things like that. But I haven't heard this piece of it discussed. And I think that's really important that that's understood by the people that are designing these um, programs and quality measures and incentives that um, questions are asked the right way. So just wondering, um, and maybe because you know people on our staff are involved in some of those other efforts. Um, so what we can do to get the word out more broadly so that it's done systematically as much as we can. We, we'd love to connect with you. We have um, some people um, from uh, HICPUF on the Blueprint to End Hunger, but I, I, I agree, I think that, um, I worry knowing what the outcomes were before and Hunger Free Colorado that is a great organization, but what happens with the food insecurity screening and referrals, there's so many drop-offs, right? Mm -hmm. You go from the physician to the community navigator to Hunger Free and eventually the state. And when we interviewed at Kaiser, the Medicaid members, they talked about the confusion with the whole process and the different drop-offs made it really frustrating and difficult for them to navigate. And um, we recently interviewed um, uh, to understand best practices and it was people that were consistent to help in, enroll families through the whole process. They didn't just um, drop them off, like the Nurse Family Partnership uh, uh, made sure that they promoted the program, helped start the enrollment, followed up to see, and, and just the general support. One of the thing opportunities, I think, is why don't we incent uh, the number of Medicaid members who are enrolled in WIC. And let's not incent, let's incent outcomes, not screening. Um, I would, and the same for, um, we know we can get eligible SNAP, uh, those uh, Medicaid members that are eligible for SNAP. Why don't we incent that? Because then you develop different partnerships could be much more strength-based. Um, I, I think the more and more, more um, Ann Netterveld and others have been do, learning more and more about screening and some of the, frankly, some of the harm of screening. I mean, so how do we do it better? And how do we uh, do process improvements? Dr. Stenmark, um, we've had a couple of comments in the chat that I would like to highlight. Um, one is, is ask, is there a one pager for all of these resources? I don't believe there is because they're all from different funding streams, but I think we could create one from this uh, webinar and, and, dis and disseminate that through the Colorado AAP. Could we do that, Ellen? Is that possible? I mean, I'm happy to create it. I just mean, you know, because so, a lot of families don't ask because they don't know the rent, the, the, what age it stops or think, you know, and so they don't want to hear no, so they just don't do it. Or some families are just too overwhelmed. But if we could make a one pager, that might be helpful for families. I'm going to jump in because I would love Leanne to clarify a little bit more. We did include a link um, in the chat to a toolkit. Um, so I'm not sure if that's, and, and I'll put it back into the box, but Leanne, do you mind coming off um, mute and, and just sharing a little bit more about um, sort of what you were thinking uh, so that we can either direct um, or create? I guess I was thinking of two things. One is so we can move our providers in a different way to ask the question, because I'm a behavioral health person and now I'm going to come at it very different than the medical provider will. And giving them that tool versus just asking a direct question, but phrasing it differently I think that would be really helpful to give them a script because change is hard for all of us and we need those prompts. And then the other thing was a one pager with um, all the different websites because I think being in rural Colorado, we're really limited on our resources. And so my biggest challenge is connecting families with special needs um, to other families with special needs to get all the resources because we hit so many barriers and I would love a one pager that says, did you know that all these things are available in Colorado and here's some websites so that we as providers, but also as a family, we can hand it to a family, they could look at it, but we can also go over it with them was my thought. 
Yeah, Leanne also put in the chat box um, that they have a, a backpack program that's funded. The backpacks are provided by the local food bank. They put things like formula and, and snacks and things like that. And they'll take the backpack, but they won't ask for any additional services. We could put that flyer in the backpack, then they would have it. And, and you know, what was interesting, I'm, I'm glad you brought up um, rural Colorado. I think um, what we found when we were doing interviews throughout the state that sometimes the rural counties, especially like Mesa, had real advantages because people knew the human service director, they knew who the WIC person was, and they did, um, they would make introductions to people and, um, what I forgot to talk about was in Mesa County, they have a family resource center that does amazing work in benefit enrollment for Medicaid, SNAP, WIC, and directs people to the home visitation programs and mental health services. So what the obstetricians do in um, Mesa is just refer everybody to um, the Family Resource Center, Be For Babies. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's there may be some of those centers where um, Family Resource Centers or other uh, hubs in your community that are already doing the uh, enrollment assistance, but um, I'm glad you raised that point and thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. So we have just a couple minutes left and I do want the, the key takeaway. Again, there's lots of information, right? Um, limited time. Um, so um, key takeaway um, from today's session, Sarah. Well, first I'd like to thank you for having me here and for all of you folks for attending. I think there's a lot of move, a room for movement in increasing enrollment in these programs. And I think, everyone on this call can uh, have a part to play in that. So thanks again. Thank you, Sarah. Christy. Again, thank you very much for uh, attending and uh, having me. I, I encourage you to not to think there is no no for all children, that there, there has to be another resource that a child can, can gain from or a family can gain from. I really encourage you to utilize the family-driven organizations as resources um, because they are there to help you all and, um, and have information that is uh, very specific to disability and willing to help you. Thank you. And then Sandy, final word. Um, just thank you for your questions and your attention. Um, Bethany, I'd love to <laughs> further work on, on, on this and I'd love to continue to learn together. I think it's um, only with all of us sharing what's working and not working will we, we be able to close this gap. And I, um, Yesterday was on a webinar where Zoe Newberger said, um, you know, her goal is how, how can we enroll all low income, eligible low income children in Medicaid, CHIP, SNAP and WIC? That would be game changing for so many families. And it'd be nice to sort of tackle that as an AAP goal so, um, for our state. So thank you all and um, please, uh, let us know your ideas, uh, your your successes, your barriers, and your needs. Mm -hmm. And thank thanks, you. And our presenters are comfortable um, for any follow up questions offline. If you want to put your emails in the box, otherwise, participants, um, we will send out an email that has um, the recording, the PowerPoint, uh, the links, and um, the toolkit. Uh, and all the stuff we shared today. Um, so with that, we will conclude our time together and we are just grateful for all that you do um, to make life better uh, for your communities and the, the kids and the families whom you serve. So thank you all, take care, bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you.